Hi, everyone. So before we start, I just wanted to start with a couple of announcements. Um, so first of all, if my slideshow works. OK, great. Uh, we have another exciting talk coming up on April 5th. Um, so building careers in cultural heritage. Um, and it's another ACER Early Career Scholars talk. And we're pleased to host a discussion with Helena Aroz and Liz Fricaro, who are professionals in the field of cultural heritage preservation, where they will share their educational and professional trajectories leading to their impactful work safeguarding cultural heritage. The event will provide valuable insight into opportunities in cultural heritage-based career paths. And registration is required, um, and the registration link will be sent out in the next few days. So stay tuned for that. Sorry, my cat is whining. So if you can hear that, that's that's a cat. Um, and then I did also want to share our um, social media handles. If you don't yet follow us, please do so. Uh, we often post about ASR early career ASR events, but also ASR more broadly. Um, and lastly, I wanted to point you to this page on the ASOR website, the Early Career Member Resources, where we have a lot of links um, to things like job sites, um, but also a lot of videos with resources useful for early career scholars. Um, so do check those out. I'm sorry, Kitty, I'm I'm working. <laughs> uh, and then we can go back to our talk today. So um, we're really pleased to have Matt Vincent here, who has dedicated over 20 years to the field of archaeology, with a particular focus on the integration of new technologies to enhance research and preservation efforts. Throughout his career, Matthew has contributed significantly to the adoption and development of various technological applications, ranging from GIS and photogrammetry to 3D printing and artificial intelligence in archaeological projects. In 2015, he was involved in founding RecRay, and please correct me if that pronunciation is incorrect. Um, no, a project, is that good? Okay. <laughs> Uh, a project that leveraged crowdsourcing to digitally preserve cultural heritage sites that have been destroyed or damaged. As a committed contributor to the field, Matthew believes in the power of technology to augment traditional archaeological methods, facilitating a deeper understanding of our past while engaging a wider audience in the protection of our cultural legacy. And today he'll be talking to us about digitizing the past, empowering archaeology through technology. So Matt, feel free to share your screen. Okay, let me get to the right place. And one I want to share and take it away. Okay. All right, well, thank you everybody uh, for taking time today. And it is my pleasure just to talk about some of my experience working in archeology. span And, you know, ironically enough, it has always uh, ended up mixing the future and the past together. Um, you know, I think it's uh, pretty incredible what we can get from, from technology, the way that it can help, so help us think about things. And um, just to begin with, I just wanna touch on this idea, what is technology in archeology? span How do we think about this? So. Obviously, there can be a lot of different things just in terms of tools. We could be talking about the way that we do our survey, the way that we acquire information, documentation, the way that we disseminate information, the way that we can share our results with people. All of these different areas can have technology in it. Um, but I always want to underline that technology should be at the service of cultural heritage. Um, I've worked in a lot of interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary programs. And oftentimes what I would end up seeing is that um, you know, people coming from the technology sector love to apply their findings and their work and whatever to cultural heritage because it's a very glamorous field to be in. It's an exciting thing. You get a little bit of Indiana Jones-esque kind of ambience about it and people get really excited to apply their, their uh, solutions to the problems that we might have. But ideally what we see here is that uh, technology works as a service to cultural heritage and archeology span specifically. And that it shouldn't just be this one way street where it's kind of like, oh, we're going to do some stuff and publish our results and walk away from it. So the, the sort of thing that we want to see in the field are truly people who are growing themselves in both of these areas, both in technology and archaeology and creating a bit of a new discipline, as it were. I think as well, we also often hear the buzzwords of things like 
cyber archaeology, digital archaeology, uh, virtual archaeology, all of these kind of uh, terms that get thrown around today. And each of them kind of have maybe a slightly different emphasis in what they're trying to talk about, about uh, technology and archaeology. But I think today we probably want to start using these extra words and, and just start talking about archaeology. I think this is our new reality. We now have technology deeply integrated into the field of archaeology. I think pretty much any presentation you go to at ASOR, you'll see some element of new technology applied to a person's work, um, whether it's something like photogrammetry or the you know way that they're using survey or even you know some of the new cutting edge things like artificial intelligence, all of these playing a role in, in archaeology one way or another. But one of the things that I think is probably uh, the idea that I want to emphasize more than anything else is that technology helps us move from a certain amount of subjectivity to greater uh, levels of objectivity. And I think this is one of the ways to conceptualize or think about what technology can be doing for us. So as an example, our, our dearly beloved Munsell color books. And we have those out in the field and, you know, you can get people, they get their, their soil sample onto the charts and they're trying to figure out, okay, is this 10 way R, you know, two slash six or three slash six or exactly what ought it, uh, ought it to be. And depending on the person or the book, how long has that book been out in the field? Have some of the chips been faded by the sun? What are the conditions, all of these things that, that can uh, uh, play an important role in exactly how those colors are being achieved and understood. Nowadays, uh, if you want to spring for, for the uh, digital reader, you can get one of these little guys, take it out to the field, and you push a button, and it's going to read the colors for you. And, you know, it's going to be exactly there. And the idea being that every person on that field could use this same reader and get the same readings, um, removing a certain level of uh, subjectivity to it. Um, likewise, when I was working at Umeri, and uh, shout out to Larry Garrity, who I see on the call here with us as another fellow Madhava Plains uh, worker. Um, one of the things that we would do is actually read the uh, soil particle types. So figuring out if it, you know, basically going from an angular soil particle or to a rounded soil particle. And uh, with the idea being that the more rounded it is, it shows, you know, higher levels of activity in that area. If it's more angular, you're looking at things just blowing into to that particular layer of sediment. But the thing is, is we can only have one person read it because it's a very subjective read. And so the idea being is that we're hopefully getting at least relatively accurate values, but there was no way for us um, to just put all these things into some sort of machine that could then give us particle sizes and say, okay, this is the distribution you're looking at it. Of course, nowadays with things like artificial intelligence and image recognition and things like that, if we could, you know, get a, a zoomed in shot of it, theoretically, we ought to be able to send that into a uh, AI generated model that would then tell us, okay, here's your distribution of particle sizes, therefore giving us something a bit more objective versus a one person's individual read on things. So with that, it kind of gives us the direction towards data driven archaeology. Um, you know, this was one of the big things at the beginning of, of Google's um, establishment as a company was the idea of data driven decisions. Everything that you do, you do based on the data that, that you have at hand. Um, so a lot of the things that we're, we're going to look at this, this uh, afternoon are going to be things focusing on uh, data-driven ideas in archaeology or more further objectivity as we think about archaeology. Now, when I started at Umeri 2004, so 20 years ago was my first season in the field, we used to use this incredible ladder. This is a five-meter ladder, and it would take about you know half a dozen people to move it around the site. It was incredibly rickety. And you'd have one person sat up top of that ladder trying to get a picture as an important part of the documentation process at the end of every season. And of course, you know, it's, it's an effective tool. It could do high enough up. You get some sort of sense of aerial photography. But at the same time, no one wanted to be the guy sat on top of that ladder. And you're a little bit limited at the same time about the perspective. And because of the time that it takes to move it around and the fact that we're always trying to shoot at the very end of the day to eliminate all the shadows and everything else, it wasn't necessarily the best tool for the job. So we started experimenting with some other things. We uh, got this, you know, incredible fiberglass boom pole that, you know, we could swing around, get some pretty amazing aerial shots. Theoretically, it should be mostly facing down. Uh, so we're not dealing with the angles and everything else. But if you look at the end where all the four of us are sat around next to this, 
you can see the amount of weights that we have to put on there to counterbalance just a simple DSLR camera. So it's not like the camera weighed that much more, but it's incredible how physics just love to play against you in a situation like that. So, you know, the, the fiberglass boom, I think lasted maybe, maybe all of one season out there, but it was also at a time when there a lot of new options were coming around. So I did uh, some of my grad school work at UC San Diego, along with Tom Levy and the rest of the cyber archaeology crew there. And of course, one of the things that they were running are these incredible helium balloons. Now, it was great because at this point in time, you didn't have to worry about flying a helium balloon because it's not part of the sort of drone regulations and everything else. So you tether yourself to this balloon and you walk around the site, but it's also a lot of work and helium is expensive and it became somewhat problematic. Uh, as soon as the Syrian civil war started, as it happened, most of the um, routes for helium was overland through Syria coming in from Turkey. And so there was actually a, a point after the first year of the Sy Syrian civil war that helium was running out in Jordan. And so this people that we were getting it from were literally running out of the tanks. And one of them was like, OK, that's our last tank. So I hope, I hope it lasts. <laughs> so we start running into problems where we can see supply and demand being issues with that, depending on political stability of the region. And of course, shortly after the helium balloon uh, was heavily employed uh, down in Fainan with our LRAP project, drones became more and more accessible. This was our first attempt at doing some drone work at, uh, at Umeri. And we got one of these uh, 3D Robotics X8 uh, octocopters. So it's got uh, rotors on both sides of each of the arms. And we've got an old Canon point and shoot camera under there. And it's got a GPS system for stability and everything else. But this was not as nice to fly as like the DJI uh, drones that we fly today. At one point, it literally was up and suddenly decided that it was somehow misorientated flipped itself over and drove itself into the ground. So, you know, it was a very nerve wracking drone to fly. And shortly after, of course, they passed the drone regulations that have made it much more strict to be able to fly the drones in Jordan. But I think drones are still probably one of the most uh, employed technologies that we have in Jordan today uh, when it comes to documenting our site. So it's always possible to get them. It's always possible to get the permissions to go through with it. And it becomes an incredibly important and invaluable tool for doing some of the documentation that we have. And we, when we go back that whole level, so I mean, we're talking from these ladders to booms, to balloons, to drones. The whole idea is that we're trying to find ways to be able to document our site. And photogrammetry today kind of changes the way that we think about uh, that documentation process. And of course, we can go a step further. We're, you know, we have satellites available to us and, and companies like Planet Labs have made uh, satellite imagery much more accessible. So there's even cases where, you know, a fairly reasonable um, price, you can get uh, images of your area, especially if they've already been acquired for some other mission and you happen to have, you know, a couple square kilometers that you want and they've got it there. You're not going to be paying thousands and thousands and thousands to have that as we did before. So, you know, they've disrupted the sat satellite imagery market and that's given us access to another way that we can visualize larger areas quite easily as well. Now, as we kind of go back to this whole process again of documenting, then we have all these sort of different instruments that we've used along the way. Now, I'm sure many of you have had to use the long cloth tapes or maybe even shorter tape measures, whether you're measuring sections or bulks or whatever it might be. Um, you know, there are all the different processes that we might have to lay out squares. Um, so for example, you know, when I first was working at Umeri, everything was laid out with, um, with compasses and the clock tapes, and it was a bit of a tedious process. And we always hoped that we could find something that we recognized from a previous season to get back there again. But then total stations make it significantly easier. And, you know, already we have ways to get very precise measurements with uh, a unit like this. We had an older, um, which was actually an electronic theodolite that we use that was used quite a bit at Umeri and was important for laying out squares. But then these new modern total stations, I mean, a lot of these are even reflector reflectorless, so you can literally just shoot a spot in the ground and it's gonna give you the measurements and you can work through it. But you still always have to have two people. So trying to work through a square setup, for example, can be very tedious, even though the measurements can be perfect. Now we have things like RTK GPS units, which are really incredible. In fact, um, one of my jobs today is to start experimenting with one of these new low cost RTK units. This is uh, cost a mere $1,200, whereas you know, a few years ago, that probably would have been about $10,000. And we'll be uh, using these to set up base stations in Jordan. So we're gonna do a couple trials first. We're gonna set one up in Acor's roof and we're gonna set one up 
hopefully down in Petra. Um, and so people within 60 kilometers of either one of those locations will be able to benefit from the corrections that we can send and then get centimeter accurate, accurate position with whatever units they're using. So when I first started uh, working with GPSs out in, in, at Umeri in 2008, we were using these ones, which were these ProMark three units. And it wasn't rare for it to take about an hour to get set up each morning. It was such a tedious process. You had to get your base set up and then you had to go localize the whole thing on three different known points across the site. And then you were really worried if you ever lost one of those points, would you ever be able to set it up again? So then we end up setting up an additional three points. And so next thing you know, you've got, you know, six or maybe 12 or, or more points around the site that you're always trying to make sure exist season after season after season. And now we're working with units like this, which are low cost, which again, those older units, you know, would have been tens of thousands to be able to get running. And a unit like this pictured here now costs about uh, $2,000. And it's incredibly li lightweight, weighs 250 grams, can fit in your pocket. Whereas before, you know, it was, it was schlepping out bag after bag after bag of material to try to be able to get it out there. And if we go back and we think about, so if we've got a total station and you wanted to create a contour map of a site, it could take you all season to do it because you have to shoot at every single one of those points. You're working with two different people. Once we got access to something like these RTK units, and I did a contour map of Umeri using one of these, it took me three days just walking over the whole site with it. But we had a lot of problems with that. Now, with something like this, again, I could probably do it in a day, day and a half, because this, the unit just works that well, and it's incredibly stable. But, if, of course, if we had a drone, we could fly the whole site in 20 to 30 minutes, get everything, and produce a highly accurate contour map with just something like that. So, of course, technology continues to shift, and we think about all these different elements of it. Now, at the same time, I used uh, GPSs to map out the site of uh, Hirwat al-Balua in, uh, in the early 2010s, so 2010, 2012. And part of the idea here is that we wanted to objectively map all the remains that were on the ground. And this, of course, took us a couple seasons to do. Um, it's a fairly large site, so the area that you're seeing here is roughly 15 hectares. And it was literally like everything that looked like an exposed wall, we just tried to map it. Um, and so in one season, we were able to get roughly um, that much material, then we combined them together. So you could see 2012 and 2010 together. Um, and then of course we can overlay that over the entire site and you can see the remains of it. And again, that kind of gave us an objective way to just begin to look at the site without having done any excavation previously, simply mapping all of the exposed material that was there. But we can only do that using something like the RTK GPS systems. If we were trying to map this with a total station, it would have probably taken us many, many seasons to do the same thing. And even this is one of those cases where, sure, we could have a high resolution drone map. But I think when you're looking at it from the sky, it's really difficult to differentiate what is what on the ground. So it's probably one of those cases where the previous step to the latest technology was the best thing for this particular job. When we go back again and we start talking about the sort of levels of 3D documentation. So one of the things that we started doing at Umeri was uh, what we would call um, 4D or, or daily photogrammetric acquisitions of every single one of our uh, excavation units. So whereas, you know, most places will do a daily photograph, we were doing daily photogrammetric acquisitions and processing all of that material. And of course, from that, we're able to extract um, 3D volumes from it that we can then differentiate from one day to the next. So for example, um, when we talk again from uh, subjectivity to objectivity, in our documentation of the field, we would always have, one of the things we'd try to do is a goof account. So, you know, how many, how much soil are we moving and we're estimating it? But at the same time, you look at the way that people fill a goof. Some people only fill it halfway. Some people have it overflowing, you know? So what does that really mean? How can we really truly objectively measure how much soil is changing from one day to the next? But using something like uh, photogrammetry, we can see here, this is, for example, the upper left one is from uh, the beginning of the season. And then the lower right is one of the final days of the season. And the color ramp there just gives a, a visual idea of how much uh, soil is moved from one day to the next. Or in the example of comparing the upper left, with the lower right gives us a, a, the differentiation of the entire season. Um, so in one way, it's a way that we could review the methodology. So we could look at one frame to the next and you see where one excavation happened one day, 
um, and then the difference of one day to the next, and you see where things are being excavated, where the soil is being moved. And of course, then it gives us a very precise count at the, at the end of it, where we can actually say, you know, what cubic metric uh, removal of, of soil do we have in that area? The other thing that we can get with this as well, like when we didn't have drones available to us, we're doing this all by walking around the excavation units, and then we can actually bring this together. So this isn't one single shot that we're looking at, but rather it is six different photogrammetric acquisitions that have all been blended into one so that we're able to get the sense of a large aerial photograph, even when we didn't have access to that sort of uh, technology at the time. Um, so it's really powerful the way that we can use and harness the technology. And in fact, one of the most important pieces of my field kit today is a selfie stick. And that selfie stick gives me about two meters and I can just hold it in my hand and I've got the phone on top and I just put it on a timer and I'm just walking around and collecting everything. So I've mapped the Aqaba church with that. I've mapped the roof at Acor with that. I've mapped, um, you know, several different sites just using my phone and a selfie stick now. And, you know, that becomes one of those really important pieces of technology. Um, we're also able to then, you know, take things like, for example, looking at the entire section of a site uh, by combining these different acquisitions together. Um, so this is looking at the Western bulk for the same squares that you saw here. Um, we're now looking at the, the Western section of it. And so it gives us an, uh, an ability to kind of look at these things combined. And then we're just zooming in a little bit so we can actually see what that looks like. And of course, then be able to do things like the bulk drawings by using photogrammetry versus trying to do it manually where there's a lot of measurement and eyeballing things and a little bit of uh, artistic interpretation when it comes to doing that. Um, so again, by bringing in the uh, photogrammetry, we're able to get a bit more of an objective uh, picture of what that might look like. Um, one of the things that I actually presented at, at ASOR uh, this last November was a way that we could also transfer our georeferencing it. Because again, you know, anytime that you have measurements that you've got to take any day, every day, and, you know, we were worried that our permanent markers might be getting moved or kicked around. Um, what we were able to do is actually figure out that if we georeference it just one day, we can then transfer the georeferencing from one model to the next for the same square. So, for example, usually what we're doing in a traditional sort of workflow is something that's called aerial triangulation, where basically you're putting some sort of fixed points on the ground that you can then measure and then you uh, georeference your entire model on that. But if the photographs that you're starting with actually have the precise georeferencing on them, then you don't actually need to use ground control points. So what we can do is essentially estimate the positions of the cameras from a day-to-day -day position uh, or day-to-day -day workflow by combining them together from one day to the next. And that lets us get a very precise direct georeferencing and maintain our models with that. Um, and so, for example, these are our pictures of what it actually ends up looking like. And we had less than two meters of error uh, from one day to the next with this method. So uh, it actually works really well. And again, just helps speed up that workflow, make it something that is actually uh, reasonable to do in um, in a daily workflow when, when you're out at site. Um, no, however, we do run into problems now and then. Uh, so earlier this week, I was up north uh, around Beit Ross trying to do a GPS survey and drone survey of the um, the Roman theater and everything that's that's in that immediate vicinity. Well, because we're further north at that time, and uh, it seems that our neighbors next to us to the west are jamming the satellites. Um, so, for example, I've never seen not having a single bar of green on the left. So you see those those bars of yellow and red. Um, those are because we're not getting the highest quality si uh, signal from it. But it was a perfect day for it, perfect visibility, nothing impeding it. But this is one of those areas where technology can fail. And so actually, like where I went up with all the GPS units to do this, I then kind of sat back and said, boy, I, I really wish I would have had a total station because I now have to go back up and remeasure those points at some other um, time, hopefully either when the satellites are working again or where I can do it with a total station instead. Um, and at the same time, because of the satellites being jammed, it causes issues with the drones. So we were flying a small DJI drone which in any other circumstance would have been incredibly easy to work with. And because I could have done a planned flight where I would have had a great, you know, systematic 3D grid of the whole thing, giving me, you know, the perfect data set to create a photogrammet photogrammetric model of the area. 
Instead, I started that programmed flight and I watched the drone just suddenly shoot off to the east. Um, and so, of course, I had had to abandon the whole thing and then uh, revert to a, a manual flight. And then ended up becoming a very nerve wracking uh, day because it would drop out of the GPS connection, go into attitude mode, which requires a lot more um, flying uh, control and, and uh, oversight than if you're just being able to fly it on automatic programmed flights. Now we move over to uh, more of the remote sensing side of things as well. And while I'm not a geophysicist and it's definitely not my area of expertise, it's uh, certainly one of the most important parts that we have in uh, archaeology today. So just a few weeks ago, we were doing a remote sur survey uh, campaign in and around the plaza in front of the treasury at Petra and going down through the outer seek on the way towards the Roman theater for any of you who are familiar with that immediate area. And we ran a combination of ground penetrating radar and um, and the, the mag here or the EM, so the electromagnetic resistivity. And so both of these are, are ways that we can get uh, subsurface um, measurements, shall we say, not quite imaging, but measurements. And it's all sort of, you know, signal re reflectance of one way or another. And it's one of those areas that we can say, yes, it's, it gives us somewhat of a more objective measure, but it is still very uh, open to interpretation. But this sort of methodology is improving all the time as well. And, you know, in this case as well, we're, we're using the uh, GPS to precisely locate it. But I would also point out this is one of those areas where the GPS is not as useful because the plaza in front of the treasury has very limited view of the sky. The entrance to the outer seek is very narrow, so no GPS signals really getting in there at all, at least nothing that's useful. But it was still enough for us to generally locate the actual acquisitions and then be able to kind of put them on the map to where, where we needed to be able to work. Um, and of course, this is the, the sort of thing that in the plaza in front of the treasury, there's very clear evidence of further tombs in that in that immediate vicinity there. But then this helps us kind of see where those might be, what we might be looking at, what sort of depths we should be thinking about. Um, and the mag got us something about six, meta, six, six meters of penetration into the ground, whereas the GPR that we were running um, didn't quite get as much. And, and some of that just has to do with the density of the material that's around there. Um, but certainly as an archaeologist, it's one of the coolest moments was to be actually running ground penetrating radar in front of and inside uh, the treasury as well. So, you know, stay tuned, hopefully some exciting things coming from this particular project. But then we go further field and if we go back to satellites and we, you know, uh, keep talking about the ideas of, of remote sensing. One of the things that uh, doesn't get used as much, although it is uh, still quite a popular thing, is hyperspectral imaging. Um, so there's a couple of things that we can get up, out of hyperspectral imaging. One of them is, of course, the ability to, to detect minerals in a particular area. So, for example, if we think about, you know, all the copper mine work uh, in the south of Jordan and the south of Israel, um, you know, being able to use hyperspectral imagery to sort of detect where copper deposits might be um, is very useful then to be able to figure out where other sites might be at. So hyperspectral imagery is, is useful in that area. But of course, now we can be flying drone based hyperspectral imagery. And so one simple thing that's used quite a bit in agriculture is to use um, drone drone based hyperspectral imagery to detect vegetation health. Now we can imagine as well, like for example, in early spring when we've got all the greenery and things are growing, we could be flying this over and vegetation health will vary depending on whether a plant is um, planted on top of a wall or just in an open area. So suddenly we can start using things like um, the hyperspectral imagery to start detecting buried features that we might not normally see otherwise, um, especially in desert climates, when if all you're looking at is sand, most of the time you're not really seeing a big difference. But the moment that we have something growing, it opens up a whole new uh, set of possibilities of things that we can see. Um, and of course, LIDAR is one that we know of. And, you know, these are our famous examples of, you know, finding entire complexes under the jungle roof that you can't see from satellite imagery. Um, so, for example, this is one of the sites that was found in Guatemala recently. And that gives a really good example that if you were just looking at it above the jungle canopy, yeah, you might see one or two structures here, but you don't see that entire complex that's sitting underneath it. So the ability for LIDAR to penetrate jungle canopies and give us a much bigger picture is, is really important. And again, because now we have drone-based LIDAR, we can fly you know, much smaller and focused sections 
um, whenever we might need to. And it's not just jungle canopies, but that gives us the ability to look at things all over the place. So one project that I um, have been working on is, is in Scotland and they're looking at some of the, you know, older clan towers and um, monuments that are in the immediate area. And one of these towers is on the side of what probably was a medieval village, but most of that village is now buried under a fairly dense canopy of um, forest and other just low bushes. And so, you know, coming to a point where uh, maybe the vegetation is thinned out a bit over winter, then flying LIDAR over it would probably give us a very clear picture of the remnants of whatever buildings might have been there and be able to relate that to the clan architecture in that area. And um, continuing on the theme, of course, of, of remote sensing, we also look at things like XRF um, and basically material uh, science altogether with it. Um, you know, so this is one of those ones that always makes us chuckle a little bit because it really does look like a gun. And, you know, you get these guys with the, the hip holster and the XRF in it, and they're walking around and taking samples of things. And it's not exactly how the science works. But of course, material information is, is really important for us in archaeology. So having the ability, again, to have something that is objectively able to measure whatever you're seeing around you can either be important for doing comparative studies or understanding a particular artifact itself, or as we often see it used with paintings, is to understand the composition of the paints that went into it. So, you know, what materials are they using to make the colors that we see represented on the painting at the time? Um, and then we kind of go into a, a sort of final area, which is starting to talk about, you know, the 3D modeling and the virtual reality and this sort of thing. Um, and one of my my dear friends in Spain is is the author of, of what's called the Seville Principles, um, which is building on the London Charter and kind of talks about how do we use something and how can we harness something like virtual reality as an incredible tool to be able to work on, on um, retelling the story of archaeology. So, for example... Um, we have in the upper left is one excavation and then, you know, the documentation of that happens in that lower left area. But there are two competing hypotheses of what that building might have looked like. And of course, rather than doing a physical reconstruction on the site that has to adopt one or those other hypotheses, by using 3D modeling and virtual um, archaeology, they're able to display the competing hypotheses and people can then explore or continue that debate using that same sort of thing. Um, likewise, the ability to, you know, quite simply, and this, you know, looks a lot less glamorous than a 3D model, but being able to display the competing hypotheses for an original course of a river um, in that area. So that becomes, uh, again, a really important tool that we might have. Um, and at the same point, like, you know, when we look at, at physical reconstructions of sites today, they usually represent something at a fixed point in time. Uh, but this one particular tower here, of course, had quite a significant history, different interventions and changes over time. And again, this is one of those areas where virtual archaeology and the 3D modeling gives us that opportunity to display those changes over time as they have been seen through the, the study of this particular building. Um, so it becomes a, an incredibly useful tool when we can say, well, yeah, we can give you the authentic reconstruction of this building at various points in time. Um, and then, of course, one of the things as well is that we're looking at trying to present this with as much historical rigor as possible. And so, for example, the model on the right, one of the big criticisms that we always have is that, yeah, we've got this thing, but it looks like a brand new, you know, perfect temple that no one's ever done anything with versus something on the left where we can see, you know, it's dirty in places. There's evidence of, you know, the ash, the burning, uh, the smoke, the soot, everything else that just makes it look like a bit more of a um realistic kind of reconstruction there and so you know while we are doing these sort of models we should still also be considering how is the best way that we can be representing um the use of these technologies and the the reconstructions through um trying to make it look like it would have the sort of dirt that would accumulate the wear and tear that we would expect to see on buildings like that this is another really really good example of what some of these look like. So this is a fairly recent one um, that was just published and shows the, um, what I'm assuming to be a photogrammetric based acquisition of the, the remains that are there today. And then of course, we got this beautiful facade right in front of it that shows a, a reconstruction as it were. 
And then this next one that kind of gives us the different uh, levels, a color-coded model that can help us understand what we are actually looking at. Um, so for example, everything in red is what we still have in C2 today and lets us look and understand, okay, those are the beginnings of it. Um, and then we've got, you know, the different fragments that could be part of a virtual anastolosis um, or parts of a, vir a virtual reconstruction onto things that are purely based, like everything that's in green there is, you know, non-structural virtual reconstruction based on sources and comparison. So, you know, it's our best guess of what something like this might look at, look like based on what we know from elsewhere, but isn't necessarily represented by the evidence on the ground. And finally, we can't talk about technology and archaeology without getting into the subject of artificial intelligence. Um, so, of course, one of the things that we've seen now for well over a decade are the sort of um, human AI collaborative workflows. And a lot of it has been focused on site detection. So whether we're, you know, processing satellite imagery, having people, you know, confirm things that they see, the sort of crowdsourcing element to it, uh, where people are trying to look for elements or particular things of a site, um, you know, which could also be just for monitoring purposes. So, you know, trying to see if we're looking at looted or damaged sites uh, through artificial intelligence um, to things, of course, like on uh, doing textual translations or recovery of text, or even deciphering text that we haven't been able to work through before through a process of artificial intelligence. Um, so it all becomes very, very exciting. And one of the things I think about with, with artificial intelligence is the ability to preserve individual researchers work. Um, so where, for example, reading pottery seems to be uh, something that could be a little bit individualistic. But if we can preserve those researchers, it could become a really important part of, of later debates. Um, having worked with Larry Herr for many years at, at Umeri, I would think about preserving the way that he reads pottery so that as things are maybe challenged or con you know, contested later on, it would be a way to be able to, to take that researcher and say, OK, we know what Larry Herr would have read this one particular shirt. Can we preserve that? Uh, through an artificial intelligence model so that as more information comes further down the line, how would that Larry Her model reinterpret um, the, the pottery that he read in the past? So, you know, we're getting to that point where we can start building these sort of AI models uh, around particular researchers and their style and maybe their interpretations that will be really important further down the line um, to be able to use as part of the archaeological debate. So that's a very broad overview of a lot of the technology um, that I see in archaeology today, but again, emphasizing this idea that we're moving always towards a more objective practice, a way that we can observe and document the field around us, um, and hopefully uh, in some way speed it up, become a bit more accurate about what we're doing, um, but also be able to preserve the work of scholars in the past and bring it um, to be able to use it again in the future as more information is uh, revealed on, from the ground. Um, so we do have time for some question and answers. Thank you so much for that really useful overview. Um, I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone else did too. Um, so as Matthew just said, we do have time for a Q&A. So if anyone has questions, I think you're welcome to put them in the chat or raise your hands. And Matthew, feel free to moderate it yourself, though I can also help you if that's better. Perfect. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so I can actually see people. There we go. I have a question for you, Matt. Thank you so much for, for this presentation. So you, you mentioned a few instances of working with the modern technology and then having to backtrack to previous technologies because of uh, limitations. Uh, wondering then, as someone who specializes this, your recommendation would be to keep all those old technologies around as we advance into and, and keep them in our toolkits, uh, which then means a pretty big monetary investment <laughs> of having to accumulate all these tools. Or if you're seeing some things like really phase out, like, uh, I don't know, total stations is not a great example because you just spoke about it, but... Uh, maybe other uh, aerial photography types of things. Yeah, um, no, and and thank you, Vanessa. That's that's a fantastic question. I mean, I think like in the case of the total station, to be really honest, in, you know, the two years that I've been working at ACOR, um, 
I think I've maybe used that total station once or twice. And mostly it was to teach people about how to use the total station. Um, you know, but there is always that, that recognition that sometimes circumstances change. And we know that after the events of October 7, um, you know, security concerns cause problems. Like right now, if you go to Aqaba, as soon as the sun sets, your phone's going to tell you you're in Cairo or Saudi Arabia. As soon as the sun rises, you're back in Aqaba. You know, obviously, officially, no one's jamming the satellites, but something's happening <laughs> and it's happening on a fairly regular basis. And, you know, so I think there's a, an understanding how, you know, current events might be affecting the way that we're able to, to conduct our work. And, you know, in the case of the survey that I did the other day, I still had to fly a drone. Um, you know, so one way or another, whether or not I had satellites, I needed to get that up. But the total station would have meant I could have then shot in points that would have actually been, you know, relatively accurate. The problem is, is I didn't have a benchmark already at the site from which I could work. So even with the total station, sure, I would have a model that would have at least been um, accurate in terms of a, a relative georeferencing. So for example, I I did manage to get points throughout the day um, and I did manage to get a fix with the RTK GPS system, but I still ended up with a total error of about, um, I think it's about 10 meters in the model, which I never get. I'm usually working with like a maximum error of five centimeters. Um, so it's just a representation of, yeah, like the technology is problematic. I could have at least done something to, to have a correct referencing internally within the model, but you know, you never know. So I, I think it's always important to think about, you know, the tools that we have today, are they always right? Are they always going to be the best thing for the job? Not necessarily. But, you know, for example, if you already have a total station, don't get rid of it. I have a question to you, actually. Um... So you you gave a lot of um, examples of technology that already exists in the field, but is there anything in archaeology that you think is still very analog and that could really benefit from technological advances? I don't know if we still have that little one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I, nothing jumps to mind that I think is particularly analog, but I, I also say that from a perspective of where I've been working and the, and the projects that I've been on and the way that we're doing things. Um, you know, and of course, it, it, there's tons of material that I haven't even touched on because of, there's so much that that is happening out there. But I think in general, like, as we think about it, and, and I would say this, you know, certainly for anyone who is... Um, really looking at, you know, where, where, where are they working in the field? What are the sort of things they can be doing? Um, at the end of the day, it's, it's to evaluate your particular interest and to ask the question, how can I make this more objective? How can I make this, you know, repeatable? And of course, as we think about technology, that's one of the biggest things is it should be repeatable. If I take a sample with that digital Munsell reader of the same thing 10 different times, I should get the same reading from it. You know, and it shouldn't matter the time of day or where I'm at or whatever, it should be the same. Um, so I, you know, I would essentially encourage people to think about, you know, what areas are you working in that seem particularly subjective? And are those then candidates for areas that we can, you know, hopefully make it more objective, repeatable, um, you know, and transferable? Because again, the thing is, if I can hand that Munsell reader to anyone in a project and say, go, go sample this. And, you know, we should still get the same results, no matter who has it in their hand. Um, you know, so that's certainly the, the sort of thing. So I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of things that are still analog, um, but, you know, are always open to uh, a, a digital lens, as it were, for us to, you know, change how we're working with it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Thank you. Any other questions? You can put them in the chat. I have a question. Hey, Matt. Hey, Craig. Sorry, sorry I came a bit late, but great talk. Um, my question is related to the uh, artificial Larry Hur you proposed. Any other archaeologists you'd like to uh, digitize? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I use the example of Larry, and I think, uh, you know, you and I talked about this at the balcony of uh, ACAR at one point this last summer, but it's certainly, um, you know, I, I think we can recover 
um, the work of a lot of archaeologists by creating these models based on their published research. And, you know, again, I think it opens up a fascinating way for us to kind of continue debates that, um, you know, otherwise might not be there um, and get voices of, you know, important uh, researchers who have worked in the area in the past and, you know, be able to understand how they might contribute to a current discussion. Of course, at this point, it's, you know, all very theoretical, but I do think that this is is something that could be done. Um, as as far as who else I might preserve, I don't know, but I'm, I'm open to suggestions. I thought at least the, the, the idea about, you know, uh, ceramic analysis is an important one, yeah. because that's obviously something that we, we don't have enough people working in ceramics, yeah. particularly in Southern yeah. Jordan. So, you know, the, the AI application of ceramic identification, you know, not to put ceramicists out of a job, they're going to be really important, right. but either to, to assist their uh, their work or, or help all of us to kind of spread around that knowledge is, is a really interesting one. So, was, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, and I think I think it's something that even even today, like, you know, if we we are able to build a model like that, it's going to be years for us to really verify those models. And what would be yeah. great is to actually have a contemporary sort of thing where we can actually have a ceramicist build their own model of themselves mm -hmm. and then actually see, like, does this agree with what I would read for this particular yeah. shirt? Um, and, you know, and of course, ceramicists, we have tons of them compared to, for example, the Gary Rolofsons and their ability to read lithics. Like, True. Yeah. you know, if, if Gary's not out there reading lithics, not a lot of other people are. Yeah. So yeah. we need to be able to preserve that ability as well. Yeah, no, it's a really interesting point. So, no, thank you. Thank you. When you're talking about these archaeologists of the past, made me think of uh, my experience at Gezer one summer when Nelson Glick spoke and he talked about how he tasted the um, sherds and could help to identify, you know, them. And I thought, uh, wouldn't that be interesting to preserve the taste of the things that you're excavating? <laughs> Just a, an idea. <laughs> Well, that would be incredible. I mean, I suppose at the end of the day, it's, you know, a chemical makeup of whatever we have in there. So the more sort of ability that we have to do a material analysis, like, yeah, maybe we can actually preserve the taste of assured. <laughs> and then I think there is a question in the chat, um, if you'd like to. Perfect. Answer. Um, all right, so let me, I'll just go ahead and read this out. So thanks so much for the informative talk. I think we talk about technology and archaeology. One of the important things we need to consider are how much data we are collecting and the storage backup archiving future accessibility of that data. Um, storage backup space is at a premium at both archaeological heritage archives and commercial backup service. This is a problem. What do you think are some solutions? Um, I, d I do agree. I mean, we do have to think about how we are preserving um, material, uh, certainly the data that we're collecting. And it's actually amazing how quickly a lot of those data vanish. Um, you know, and I think it's important for us to be working with projects like Open Context or, you know, the Alexandria um, Archive Institute and their ability to kind of work on storage um, and, and preservation strategies. Because of course, it's not just storing the material, but being able to access it again, being able to find what it is that you need. I mean, how many of us have, you know, dozens of hard drives sitting around and you open up that hard drive and you're like, boy, what is on here? What is this? What is all of it? Um, I do think, you know, we're looking at potentials within technology today that may revolutionize storage space. So, you know, there's a couple of things that are kind of on the horizon at the moment that just may blow away all of the, the storage space at the moment. And of course, it is going to be in a huge demand. Um, the more that we see artificial intelligence and, you know, it consumes huge amounts of space to do the training, um, which then produces still significantly large um, AI models as well. Uh, but I, we are looking at, at a point in time where I think space is going to be more and more in a demand, but hopefully at the same time, we're seeing the shifts in technology that make it a bit more accessible. Um, but I think it's important that, you know, we we think about what it is that we are collecting, how we're storing it, what we're doing with it. And if I were to go back to uh, the principles of Sevilla, um, which I was just mentioning before, one of them is talking about the sort of efficiency of what we do in the field and not necessarily just doing something for the sake of doing it. So, for example, if we do a photogrammetric acquisition on a site, do we need to run terrestrial LIDAR at the same time? Possibly not. Is it okay to do one or the other? Um, 
what are things that need to live long term and what are the things that you know can just sit on the side you know what what are the things that um are okay if we lose them and so i think it's you know kind of comparing all of these and sometimes yeah it's the end results but for example with photogrammetry it's like i'm all about let no keep the raw photos and you can always reprocess it and you know generate whatever you need out of it um as long as you've got those original photographs um but you know it is it is a big problem and you know we do start generating a big data problem but we still generate a lot less than other fields. Um, so it's not one that I'm particularly concerned about. And I do think technology is going to shift in a way that storage will cease to be a particular um, uh, worry for us. Thank you for um, such a, a wonderful talk. Um, I'm actually a student starting my journey into this um world of archaeology and and everything else um what i'm interested in is the um skills that are being taught um and and as you say you you want to be able to reproduce results on a consistent basis um are we um leaving students behind by not introducing them to some of these technologies at an earlier point in their career? That's a really, really good question, Michael. Um, you know, some of the discussions that I've had in this past year, um, particularly around cultural heritage and archaeology, um, there is a feeling today that there is a bit of an injustice if we aren't teaching people um, the broader skills there. And furthermore, even to, to the point of saying like, you know, training someone just in archaeology today is incredibly difficult. You know, job opportunities, employability in archaeology isn't what it used to be. Um, you certainly have some countries like North America and the United States where you have CRM archaeology as, you know, one way that a person can make a living. Um, but, you know, outside of that, oftentimes it's strictly in an, an academic trajectory, which is not necessarily what everyone wants to do. You can want to be an archaeologist, but not want to be an academic. Um, you know, so I do think this is one of those areas where having kind of a broad set of skills that gives you that ability to um, pivot if you need to, if you're not finding the the sort of uh, career track that's working for you. Um, but at the same time, I, I do believe, like I said at the beginning of the talk, um, I think we're getting to that point where we stop, where we need to stop saying digital archaeology, virtual archaeology, or, you know, any of these sort of things that try and separate this idea and actually that these skills should just simply be part of archaeology. Um, so understanding how to do a photogrammetric acquisition of an archaeological unit. I mean, you know, it's pretty well known how to do that today. It's fairly teachable. It's fairly accessible. Um, you know, so those are things that we can do. I mean, if we have the capacity to teach um, you know, someone to do XRF sampling of uh, heritage material or you know, how to fly a drone or any of these sorts of things. They're transferable skills that I think help anybody in any career that they're in, um, but certainly should be part of the archaeological uh, toolkit as it were today. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I, I mean, this is my third career. I started off in telecommunications and went into IT and mm -hmm. now I'm doing archaeology. And, and, a lot of the points that you mentioned around data storage and things like that are very relevant and are of concern for smaller organisations, I guess, where they don't have that ability to transfer and and keep um, what they have in records up to date. But, yeah, um, yeah I, 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 it, it, it's interesting that, there's so many possibilities out there where that transfer of skill is is essential, really. Um, yeah. And yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing where things do do go for myself. Awesome. Well, good luck, Michael. I hope uh, hope things move in an amazing direction for you. Any other questions? I can also add uh, 
to Matt's point that um, choosing an excavation specifically because they're using those techniques can be a very smart choice for a student to do their field school. There are plenty that do and plenty that don't that implement all this stuff. Uh, uh, so if you're interested in learning, which is a wise career choice, as, as Matt mentioned, then uh, it can be about selecting a field school, knowing that they implement these types of uh, methodologies. 100%. Yeah, and as Vanessa said, there are a lot of uh, excavations or field schools now that advertise specifically that this is the sort of thing that they're doing. This is what they're working on. And, you know, again, as, as I said at the beginning, I don't think we're ever trying to necessarily replace traditional skill sets, but rather augment them. So, for example, you know, as like what Craig and I were talking about with, the, you know, the digital Larry Her. Um, it's fantastic, but we still need people who are ceramicists. We need people who are intimately familiar with ceramics, reading ceramics, understanding ceramics, and they're going to be the best people to create the sort of AI models around ceramics. So, you know, it's all about how we combine those. We don't want to lose the traditional methodologies, but we certainly want to be able to augment them and increase them through new technology like this. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Matt. If we don't have any more questions, I guess we can end a bit early. Um, but again, this was a fantastic talk. And I think, well, as the questions show, I think we all have a lot to think about. So thanks so much. Thank you so much.